If you have spent more than 15 minutes in a theater class, you have no doubt heard of Aristotle's Poetics. This work is well known for its introduction to concepts like catharsis and its analysis of Greek tragedy. It has been hugely influential since its creation to playwrights and academics alike. But it's a pretty dense piece of work. There is a lot of content, and as a translated piece, there is sometimes confusion or debate over what the text actually says. But I'm here to help you through it. Today, we're going to take a look at poetics and strip it down to some of its most important core aspects. Hopefully, with this information, you will walk away with a better understanding of this ever-important text and the necessary tools for some good old-fashioned play analysis. First, let's start off with a little history lesson. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher born in Macedonia in 384 BCE. While he is likely most known for his work in theater and poetry, Aristotle was one of the first scientists and had a lot of writings in a wide variety of fields, such as biology, physics, politics, and logic. Aristotle joined Plato's Academy in Athens when he was a teenager and studied under Plato for 20 years. Plato's Republic is another well-known and significant work by a Greek philosopher. Plato doesn't really have anything nice to say about art, believing that life is an imitation of something perfect, leaving art as nothing more than an imitation of an imitation. Aristotle's poetics, then, can be read as a response to Plato's ideas of theater and poetry from a philosophical standpoint. Unfortunately, as with many early texts, portions of poetics have been lost. It is believed that poetics was actually two books, one on tragedy and one on comedy, but only the portion of Aristotle's work on tragedy has survived to this day. It is also believed that what we have of poetics is not the final version or even a version intended for publication at all. It is very possible that what we have collected are actually lecture notes for presentations rather than a text created for one to read. It is also really important to remember the purpose of Aristotle's poetics. It would be incredibly inaccurate to ask whether a Greek play followed the rules of Aristotle's poetics for two reasons. Firstly, Greek theater came before poetics. There is no way for someone to follow the rules of a work that hasn't been created yet. And secondly, the ideas presented in poetics are not meant to be treated as rules for theater, but rather an analysis and a commentary on Greek theater, its value, and its success. Now. Let's move on to some of the basic elements discussed in Poetics. First, let's start off with Aristotle's definition of tragedy. Tragedy is an imitation of an action that is admirable, complete, and possesses magnitude. In language made pleasurable, performed by actors, not through narration, affecting through pity and fear the purification of such emotions. To make sense of this definition, we are going to take a look at Aristotle's six components of tragedy. Plot, character, thought, diction, melody, and spectacle. First, we'll start off with plot. Plot refers to the story or action of the play, and according to Aristotle, plot is the most important thing of all. As stated in the definition, the story must follow a complete arc by having a beginning, middle, and end. This means that there should be no unsolved questions at the end of the play, nor any cliffhanger endings. The crisis or problem in the plot must contain magnitude, which really just means that the problem should matter. The problem should not be trivial or unimportant. It should instead carry great consequence. The plot should also be universal. The global ideas explored in the plot should be accessible and relatable to everyone, regardless of who they are. Next up is character. Aristotle believed that characters are secondary to the plot. Tragedy is not an imitation of persons, but of actions and of life. Furthermore, there could not be a tragedy without plot, but there could be one without character. And while character is not the most important aspect of tragedy, there are still some important guidelines. Firstly, the character should be good. The character should be of a higher status than the audience, should be likable, and should be generally a good person. However, they should not be perfect. The characters should also be consistent. They should be a cohesive, recognizable character throughout the entirety of the play. Next up is thought. Tragedy should have some sort of overarching message, lesson, or ask an important question. 
The thought should be a unifying aspect of the play, which is why in modern times it is also sometimes referred to as the spine. Next, we have diction, also sometimes referred to as language. Diction refers to the way in which thought is verbally communicated. There are many aspects of diction and language that should be considered, such as the use of prose or verse, rhythm, rhyme, slang, asides, monologues. In the definition of tragedy, there are two specific references to diction and language. Firstly, that the language should be pleasurable. It should not be difficult to listen to. It should be enjoyable. And secondly, that the action should take place through actors rather than through narration. Though some narration can be used, most of the story should be told through the action or natural dialogue of the actors. Next, we have melody, sometimes also referred to as music. However, it encompasses more than just musical elements. It also refers to the collective sound in a play, the rhythm of dialogue, the sound effects of battle, as well as the music. And lastly, we have spectacle, which refers to the visual elements of the play, such as costume, set, lighting, props, and movement. Of course, the visuals of a play are important to its impact, but Aristotle believed that other aspects, such as plot, were more important than spectacle. He believed that a playwright should not rely solely on spectacle to produce a good play, but rather focus on more telling and more significant elements. So there are the six components of tragedy, according to Aristotle. But there are still some other important terms and aspects that you should be familiar with. Let's start with catharsis. Catharsis is known as the purgation of pity and fear. The idea was that through watching pitiful and fearful events happen on stage, one could be purged or purified of these emotions. This idea is very important to theater across time, but it has also been used and referenced in other fields such as psychology and medicine. Another important term you may already be familiar with is hamartia. You may have heard this term used to describe a character's fatal flaw. However, we now know that a more accurate translation would actually describe a character's mistake, error, or miscalculation. A mistake possesses some kind of responsibility, whereas there is not much a character can do to change a fatal flaw. For example, let's take a look at Hamlet. Hamlet's fatal flaw is often attributed to his procrastination or laziness. But rather, when examining his hamartia, we should look for his great mistake. Hamlet's biggest mistake is arguably not killing Claudius immediately. Doing so would have avoided much of the chaos and damage that occurred throughout the play. Recognition and reversal is another really important aspect of the plot. Recognition refers to moments of understanding and realization. Reversal refers to moments where we think there will be or should be recognition, but there is not. Oedipus, for example, has many moments of reversal when we think he will finally understand that he has already completed the prophecy. When he actually does realize this, the previous reversals make that moment of recognition more powerful. Poetics also talks about the three unities, the unities of time, place, and action. The unity of time suggests that the play should take place in a day or as close to it as possible. The unity of place suggests that a play should take place in one location. The stage should not represent more than one space, nor should the action change location. And the unity of action suggests that the plot should contain a single unified action, no side stories or subplots, just one complete story. Those are the basics. Now, you may be wondering, why on earth do I need to learn this? Well, firstly, if you're studying theater, Aristotle's poetics is pretty much unavoidable. But beyond that, this text is still around for a reason. Poetics has affected playwrights and actors and academics since its creation to modern day. Let's look at two of my favorite examples of how poetics has affected theater practice, French Neoclassicism and Restoration Theater. French Neoclassicism is well known for being a period in time where theater was heavily constrained and censored. Plays in this time treated the guidelines and poetics like law. The unities were especially important. Restoration Theatre, on the other hand, had a lot of respect for the guidelines set out in poetics, but did not treat them like law. The following of these guidelines was subject to justification. One could decide whether or not a constraint worked or was important. For example, The Rover by Afrobend follows the unity of time because it serves the play well. 
The rover follows several characters at a party one night, many of which have some sort of goal or job to complete before the next morning. Having the play take place in such a short time frame makes sense and helps to increase the dramatic tension. Even today, Aristotle has many critics and supporters who analyze, summarize, and reinvent his work. There have been many papers published on the contributions his work has made to art, but also in fields outside of art like psychology. A lot of authors have presented theories on what they believe Aristotle's core motivations and values might have been based on his work, but by far my favorite comment made in recent times about Aristotle's beliefs based on poetics is this. Both knowledge and art, for Aristotle in principle, contribute to our becoming excellent people. Poetics is far more than just a text about theater. But of course, poetics is still vital in terms of play analysis. In school, you will inevitably use the ideas outlined in poetics to compare different plays across different time periods. But why would you want to do this? Well, for one, seeing how theater practices have changed over time is actually pretty cool. By comparing theater practices in different times, you can draw some pretty interesting conclusions about the historical context. What was valued, plot, or character? What does this say about the time when the play was written and performed in? Why do we still do X but not Y? Besides just looking at interesting changes a playwright has made in an adaptation, there is a lot play analysis can tell us. Now, of course, a lot of these in-depth analyses require a lot more research beyond poetics. But now you can see how important it is as a base. All this research and analysis has to start somewhere. Having a solid understanding of this text is vital if you plan to pursue a practical or academic career in theater. But even if you don't, it would be a shame to ignore such an important text. I mean, there is a reason that it is still around and relevant today. Well, there you have it. Aristotle's Poetics for the Overwhelmed Theater Student. I really hope that you have found this information helpful and maybe even a little bit interesting. Best of luck out there. Thank you.